But he says that we've been according to the purpose of him who works all things after the counsel of his will. What have we been pre predestined to? The Bible says that we've been predestined to be, to be conformed into the image of Christ. This has nothing to do with predestined to be saved or not be saved. That has nothing to do with it. We've been predestined to be conformed to the image of Christ. So that means anyone who comes into the body of Christ has that predetermination. That God's intention and God's will is for the purpose that you be conformed into the image of his son. Amen? Praise God. Okay. The definition of the decrees, and we're getting uh, most of my uh, material from the Lectures in Systematic Theology book. I think you have that, Pastor, at home. Uh, in chapter 10, on the decrees of God. It's very good, so I thought I'd be using the outline here. And the decrees of God may be defined as God's eternal purpose. In a real sense, all things are embraced in only one purpose. And that's for his glory. Out of his wisdom and his holy counsel, God works things out. Now, how many know that God doesn't have a contingency plan in case something goes wrong? God already knows what's going to go wrong. And the, and the plan that he already has in other words, when you have a crisis, God doesn't have to go, oh, Tara has a crisis. What are we going to do now? No, he already knows. And everything has been already worked out for us if we would just follow in what he wants us to do. Amen? Praise the Lord. So this, uh, this definition of the decrees is described in several items. I have seven of them. Um, I'm going to just go through them quickly. The first decree that, uh, of God's eternal purpose is he does not make his plans or alter them as human history develops. In other words, as human history develops, God's not saying, okay, now I'm going to do this. Okay, now I'm going to do that. No, God already has it planned. God has everything under his control. Now, look at Psalm 33, verse 11. Psalm 33, verse 11. The counsel of the Lord standeth forever. The thoughts of his heart to all generations. The counsel of the Lord stands. Now, there are things that have been predetermined by God that are efficacious. That means successful in producing a desired and intended result. God already has those already. Then he has his permissive will. In other words, when you read in the book of Revelation, you're reading not only parts of it being the time that was in John's time, the Apostle John, but also futuristic. We don't need, we don't need fortune tellers or soothsayers to try to tell us what the future is going to be. Just read the book of Revelation. The things in Revelation that God has already predetermined are going to happen no matter what man tries to do to alter it. So many times we've seen how the enemy has tried to wipe out Israel. So many times in history we have seen the uh, people and nations attack Israel and try to destroy that little tiny nation that's no bigger than Rhode Island. Think about that. No bigger than Rhode Island. And yet, every single time, they don't have the, the greatest army, numerically, but they have someone. Oh, hallelujah. 
They have someone standing behind them. God said, I will bless those that bless thee, and I will curse those that curse thee. And so Abinajab from uh, Iran can rant and rave about the destruction of Israel. It's not going to happen. Not going to happen. Because God's already predetermined in the book of Revelation. That Israel has to go through the time of Jacob's trouble. And for them to go through the, the, the time of Jacob's trouble, they have to be in existence. So there are things in the Bible, there are things in the end time prophetic realm that still need to be taking place that has not taken place yet. So that's how we know that God still has everything in the control. Even though when we look at the world and we see things that kind of spiraling out of course. We see, I don't know if you noticed this, but I, <clears throat> the other day I counted, there was 33 earthquakes all across the world in one day. 33. Now, I don't know if that interests you, but that interests me. Because Jesus said, in the last days, there shall be diverse earthquakes in diverse places. There shall be earthquake in diverse places. And that's talking about all at the same time, not like one here in the United States, and then the week, one in, in uh, Asia, and then one somewhere else. No, he says, when, the, when you see, they're going to start to escalate. They're going to start coming more and more and more and more and more. 33 in one day. All over the world. We had, I think, seven or eight just in Alaska and off the coast of Alaska. Now, with all of the things that are going to happen, with all the things that Jesus said was going to happen, all the decrees that he says, that where I am, there you may be also, for I go to prepare a place for you. If we have that in our hearts and in our, in our spirit, in our mind, then no matter what happens to us, we'll be in a better place. To be with him. We don't have to fear death. Death is not something that we have to fear as Christians. Because we know we're going to a better place. We know we're going to a place to be with Jesus. And to fulfill the very things that he said. Lo, I am with you always. Where I am, there you will be also. Those are decrees that God has made that will happen, okay? So Psalm 135, verse 6 says, His counsel stands forever. Amen. You don't have to worry about when somebody says uh, they're going to blow up this or blow up that. Or the, we're, going to, we're going to go into nuclear war and the, everybody's panicking. Like 9-11, everybody panicked. Everybody ran to church. Well, what did that tell you? That told you that when the time of crisis came, they wanted God, but when the crisis was over, they don't want God. So they only want God in their crisis. They don't want God after that. For the counsel of the Lord stands forever. Forever. This word is going to stand forever. Not one jot or tittle of the law, of, of the word of God, is going to not go unfulfilled. He's going to fulfill it. The de number two, the decrees are based on most wise and holy counsel. He is omniscient and so knows what is best, and he is absolutely holy and so cannot purpose anything that is wrong. Look at Isaiah 48, verse 11. He cannot purpose anything that is wrong. Isaiah 48, 11. For my own sake, 
he said, even for my own sake will I do it. For how should my name be polluted? And I will not give my glory unto another. God is going to fulfill what he wants to fulfill, and you cannot stop it. Hallelujah. When God makes a decree about something, now some people do not believe that God can make a decree that can defy the very natural. Well, you know, God made natural laws and made gravity, and therefore, you know, he... no, man can defy gravity. Just look up in the sky at a plane. Man's ingenuity can defy gravity. What makes you think God can't defy gravity? Gravity's a natural law, but God is a higher law than the natural law because he created the natural law, so he's not a part of the natural law. He is greater than the natural law. That's why he could say to Peter when Peter said, bid me to come. And he said, Peter, come. And Peter walked on the water. It's not because Peter was holy and he was some great apostle. It was because of the decree of Almighty God, which was Jesus Christ in the flesh. When he gave Peter the, the, the right to come, he said, come. Peter got out of the boat and he walked on the water. He was walking on the divine Providence of God's command. Now, you can try to defy gravity yourself and go in a boat and try to walk on water, and you are not going to make it very far. But when you have God's decree about something, and He decrees it, it's going to happen. Amen? Three, the decrees originate in God's freedom. Look at Psalm 135, verse 6. Psalm 135, verse 6. Whatsoever, say it with me, whatsoever. The Lord pleased, that did he in heaven... Amen, in heaven, right? When did heaven come into existence? Heaven always came, was always in existence. God was always in existence. Where God is is where heaven is. Whatever he pleased that he did, he did in heaven... And in earth and in the seas and all deep places. Whatsoever the Lord pleased. Isn't it interesting? Isn't it interesting that we as human beings cannot fully accept that until we have faith? Your reason cannot accept that. Your intellect cannot accept that. Because without faith, it's impossible to please God. It takes faith to believe what God says. Somebody once asked me, said, don't, don't you ever, did you ever doubt God? Can do this or do that? I said, no. No, I don't doubt that. The question isn't, that, do I doubt God can do it? And most of us will say this is true. We say, but will he? That's the part we get stuck on. 
Not that whether he can do it or not. He can do it. He's God. He can do anything except lie. Someone asked the question one time, can God create a rock so big that even he can't pick it up? I said, no, that would, be, that would, be, that would go outside of his divine wisdom. He would never do that. Because then the rock would be greater than him. There's nothing greater than who he is. He's Alpha and Omega, beginning and the end. And the in-between. There's nothing that we can even fathom or think that can even comprehend God and his fullness. That's why he said, I have not seen, ear hath not heard, neither has it entered the heart of man or in the mind. The things that God has prepared for those that love him. Now I know that sometimes you and I get anxious. You know, it's like when uh, I know if I tell Lin Linda, I says, I got you a surprise. Okay, she'll bug me and bug me to tell me, to ask me and tell me, you know, talk to me and say, what is it? What is it? I said, I'm not telling you, it's a surprise. No, I want you to tell me. Sometimes I do, sometimes I don't. But it's the anticipation. Getting a surprise? God has surprises for you. Eye hath not seen, ear hath not heard, neither has it entered the heart of man, things that God has prepared for you. Now, do, let me ask you this. Does God give cheap things? No, God gives the best things. He's got the best for us. Not the second best. He's got the best for us. That's why we always seek him for his will, for his best. Don't settle for second best. Come on, somebody. We do that sometimes. We settle for something less than God's perfect will. And when we do that, we get in trouble. How many can verify that? <laughs> Amen. And sometimes God tries to tell us, you know, and sometimes he sends someone into your life or your pastor and he says, I don't know if you should do that. I don't know. I got a little check in my spirit. It's not that we're trying to control or, or do it, but, you know, God speaks to us. I know he speaks to you, but sometimes we get so caught up in something we, don't, we can't see the, the forest for the trees. But God has something so special for us that it should, it should make you want to serve him knowing that he's got a surprise for you. Amen. Hallelujah. Also, he is not obligated to propose anything at extra, but purposes unconstrainingly, if he purposes at all. He's not obligated. For he is omni, omnipotent. And able to do all that he desires. Look at Daniel 4.35 tonight. Let me get a little sip here. And all the inhabitants of the earth are reputed as nothing. And he doeth according to his will... In the army of heaven and among the inhabitants of the earth. And none can stay his hand or say unto him, What doest thou? Can you do that in the NLT for me? <clears throat> and all the people of the earth are nothing compared to him. He does as he pleases among the angels of heaven and among the people of the earth. No one can stop him or say to him, what do you mean by doing these things? Wow. 
Wow. You know, um, we all have personalities. We all have different traits. We all have different strengths and weaknesses and so forth in our personality makeup. I can't complain to God how he made me. Why couldn't you make me like this person? Why couldn't you make me like that person? No, God made you the way you are. But I want to tell you something. Ever since I preached that Sunday on the heart, ever since I preached that message, God's been doing something in my heart. Incredible. Because I'm telling him and I'm, I'm saying, God, I want you to change my heart. You know, out of the heart come the issues of life. Uh, you know, out of the heart come all kinds of sin and all kinds of degradation and all kinds of things. And I say, God, change my heart. Not my mind. Change my heart first, then change my mind. Change my heart. We sing that song, Change My Heart, Oh God. We just sing that song, but we don't really. I told you there's new neurons in the heart that hold 40,000 neurons in the heart that produce thoughts. He even said it out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. And God's been doing something in me. I've been working on a message, and yesterday, I, 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 I got up, and from morning till late afternoon, I stayed home in my robe, on my computer, in my Bible, studying and putting together this other teaching that I'm going to be doing. And one of the weaknesses in my, my personality is discipline. I have to force myself. This was no force. It was just like, and I was like, God. You're doing something in me, you know? And uh, Linda said, oh, she, she texted me. She said, I've been watching this video by David Wilkinson. She said, oh, I got so convicted. She said, I need to spend more time in God's word. I'm going to watch less TV. God's doing the work. Oh, we ain't got time for the Bible. We ain't got time to read. Yeah, we ain't got time to read because you spend all your time in front of the tube. Hello? Well, you don't understand, Pastor. It's, it's very lonely. You got somebody. Not if that person's sticking their nose in the book. Hello? It's very easy. Very subtle. But he says, look, what do you mean by doing these things? We can't even say, we can't tell God what to do. I mean, there are people that really believe that they can tell what God what to do. There was a segment of, of Christians, and I really haven't heard too much about them lately, because I think they got straightened out, but there was a bunch of Christians at one time, because of a, of a, a, a phrase in the Old Testament that says, command ye me, and they were going around teaching that where to command God. Because they put a period there, and it should have been a question. According to some of the commentators and those that are experts in Hebrew, they said there should not have been a statement. It should have been a question. So instead of command ye me, instead of command ye me. But just think for a moment, though. Just think about it. little P on us trying to command God. Like God is some genie in the bottle, and all we have to do is rub him the right way by saying the right words. And he's going to do what we, we, we command. No. He works all things after the counsel of his own will. Come on, somebody. The decrees have their, as their end the glory of God. They do not primarily aim at the happiness of the creature. Hello? What do you mean, Pastor? 
God wants us to be happy. Yeah, well, that's true. But not everything that God's will determines is for our happiness. I'm sure the, uh, the uh, Apostle Peter was not very happy when they crucified him upside down. I don't think the Apostle Paul was that happy when they cut his head off. I don't think James was so too happy when they thrust him through with a spear. I don't think some of the Christians that were killed for their faith and burnt at the stake were very happy. Hello? Sometimes the purpose of God we can't understand. But it's all for his glory. I told you once when I was in India and I was real sick, I, I asked God, I cried, I said, God, why am I so sick? And he said, all for the sake of the gospel. As soon as he told me that, I accepted it and I stopped my whining. I said, okay, God, you gave me your word. That was the reason why, for the sake of the gospel, I can do this. I'm willing to do it, God, all for the sake of the gospel. I don't know how you can do it, Pastor. How can you go to some of these nations in these countries like Nigeria? They're so dirty and filthy in India where you can walk into a place, you can walk into a town, uh, walk into a slum area. And when I say a slum area, it's nothing like around here. I'm talking about open sewage where the urine and feces are, are flowing through and the stench and the heat of all of that. How can you do that? All for the sake of the gospel. There's a God's purpose. The decrees have their end. As their end, the glory of God, they do not primarily aim at the happiness of the creature, nor at the perfecting of the saints, although both of these are included in his aims, but at the glory of him who is absolute perfection. Let's look at Numbers 14, 21. He said, but as surely as I live and as surely as the earth is filled with the Lord's glory. The earth is filled with the Lord's glory? Hmm. Why am I seeing murder and All this stuff going on. Where's God's glory in all of that? It cannot be sensed by the natural eye. How many know there's a natural realm and then there's a spiritual realm? I listen to some people's testimonies of how they've been visited by angels. <clears throat> but in the physical realm, you can't see them. How many believe that you can be a, have a visitation from an angel? I do. I remember Vicky telling that story about that man, I don't know whether he was in Brazil or somewhere, where he was going to kill himself on the train, and, 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 and all of a sudden God opened his eyes, and he saw that there was an angel, and he was holding back that train from moving. I believe that there's a spiritual realm, there's a natural realm, and most of the time we as Christians, we, we walk, of course we live in the natural realm, but, but we also think in the natural realm. And we don't understand that God is spirit, and that when he says, I'm with you always, it's not just something that he said just to say it to make you feel good. But he's actually with us 
not only in his omnipotence or omnipresence, but in what's called the manifest presence. I'm telling you, yesterday all I could do was weep. I don't know why I was weeping, except for the presence of God. I just felt his presence so strongly. And, and you had texted me about praying for you, and then I responded with that text, right? And as I was responding to that text, the presence of God, I was weeping. I was like, God, he said, I'm with you. I'm with you, not just in theological affirmation of thought, in doctrinal teaching, but I am with you. When you drive your car, he's with you. When you're in the marketplace, he's with you. How do you know that, Pastor? He says, I'll never leave you. Then how come when I'm really going through a battle, it feels like he's not anywhere around? Because you are listening to the dictates of your feelings rather than the reality of the truth. Because if your feelings are true, then Jesus is a liar. If you feel that God has forsaken you, you feel it, then God's, Jesus is a liar because he said, I'll never leave you nor forsake you. So either Jesus is true or your feelings are true. Hello? I'll take Jesus. Now, I'm not saying you deny that feeling. You're feeling lonely or depressed or whatever it may be you're going through. But you say, God, I'm feeling this way. However, your word says. And the moment you begin to act faith in God, in his word, that's when he comes. For without faith, it's impossible to please God. He that pleases God is God. You've got to earnestly seek Him. That doesn't mean just in prayer. That means believing what He said. I hope you're getting this. There are two kinds of decrees they're efficacious and permissive. There are things which God purposes that He also determines efficaciously to bring about which means successful in producing a desired or intended result. God has intended results of things coming to pass. And it's things that he permits for whatever reason. Sometimes we don't understand everything. And I remember what Brother uh, Diamond said when he got saved. He said to God, God, I read this whole book from front to back, and I don't understand a thing. And God said, I didn't tell you to understand everything. I told you to believe it. Hello? I don't understand how God does certain things or why he allows certain things. None of my business. All I have to do is believe what he said. There are other things which he merely determines to permit. Look at Romans 8.28.
And we surmise and we hope and we think. What does it say? How do we know that? How do you know that all things work together for good to them that love God? How do you know that? But, because he said so. That's what I mean by believing it. Because he said so. Now, doesn't it frustrate you when a parent has to talk to their little child that's acting up five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten times? Why do I have to do that, mommy? Because I said so. That's all you have to know, because I said so. I'm the parent, and I say so, and that's it. That's all you need to know, right? When my father said that to me, I didn't have to question. If I would have said some of the things that my the kids say to their, their parents today, huh? no. We know that all things work together for good because if you've been a Christian long enough, you've gone through some things. And you've gone through some fires. And you've gone through some floods. But you've gone through them. And though you walk through the valley of the shadow of death, you fear no evil. Why? Because God's rod and staff are with you. You're going to go through valleys. You're going to go through dry spells. What's the purpose of a dry spell? To make you thirsty. Lord, I thirst for you. Well, get ready because you're going through a dry spell. You ever just drink to drink? No, you drink because you're thirsty. You know, when you've had a meal, you don't want to eat again. Of course, unless it's dessert or something, you know. But, but if you have a meal, you're full. You don't want to eat anymore. How many times have you been at someone's house and you had a great meal and the person said, have some more? Oh, no, I can't. When do you want more? When you're hungry. He works and we know that all things work together for good to who? To them that love God. Not everything works together for, for good to everybody. There's a pre-qualifier there. To them that love God. To them who are called according to his purpose he works all things together for our good He says, when you go through the fire, you will not be burned. Neither shall the flame kindle upon thee. When you go through the waters, they will not overflow thee. Look at Isaiah 6, 3. Um, no, never mind. Um, but even in the different cases where God has used his permissive decrees, he overrules all for his glory. Matthew 18, 7. He says, Woe unto the world because of offenses, but for if that must needs be that offenses come. In other words, your offenses are going to come. 
Woe unto the world because of the offenses, for it must needs that offenses will come. Can I tell you that as a Christian, a follower of Christ, now, not too many Christians like this, but that's too bad. You are going to suffer. What's persecution? Suffering. All those who will live Christ, all those who will live godly in Christ shall suffer persecution. People are not going to always love you. People are not always going to agree with you. People are going to come against you. They're going to say all manner of evil. They're going to call you a lunatic. They're going to call you crazy. They're going to call you brainwashed. Hello? They may even persecute you, spit on you, mock you, ridicule you. Why? Because of Christ in you. Because your mind has been washed in the blood of the Lamb. You're thinking clearly now. Offenses will come. Believe me. They come from the world. God permits those to come. And finally, the decrees embrace all that comes to pass. They include all the past, present, and future. And they embrace the things which he efficaciously brings about and the things which merely he permits. Isaiah 46.10. Declaring the end from the beginning... Wow. And from ancient times, the things that are not yet done, saying, my counsel shall stand and I will do all my pleasure. Even that which has not yet been done, God already knows about. Now, even in all of that, you now think about this now, right? Where God knows everything, yet he still loves us. All of our little idiosyncrasies and our sins and our shortcomings and our failures and everything else, even all of that stuff, God knows all about it. And yet, loves us. So what does that do? Does that, when, when somebody loves you like that, and you know you can be yourself with God, no pretense, because you can't pretend with God, He already knows. And so you're open and you're honest and your heart is open with God and you say, God, search my heart, oh God, search me. Take out those things that are in me. Why do you do that? Because you want to love somebody that loves you. You want to. Not because you have to. You love them because you want to. If your wife or your husband is a dictator, only looks at you as a piece of property like in some parts of the world, 
You're less than nothing. You're just something that I own. And don't treat you with respect and love you and appreciate you. How are you going to feel to that person? But if that person loves you and nurtures you and holds your hand and opens the door for you once in a while, cooks for you, does, you know what I mean, does things, wants to spend time with you, respects you, you want to give your love to that person. In other words, with infinite power and infinite wisdom, God has from all eternity past, decided, and chosen and determined the course of all events without exception for all eternity to come. Now, I got several pages here. I only did the first page. But I want us to look at this scripture. Isaiah 14, 24, and 26. Or 24 first. The Lord of hosts hath sworn. Now, that doesn't mean he used vulgar language. That he attests the truth. Saying, surely, as I have thought, so shall it come to pass. And as I have purposed, so shall it stand. Wow. Wow. Surely as God has thought, so shall it come to pass. You want to see God's thoughts? Here it is. God inspired this book. Written by the inspiration of God. Man penned it, but God inspired it. These are, this is God's word. That's why we call it God's word. These are his thoughts. You know the thoughts he has towards you, thoughts of peace, not of evil, to give you an expected end? He says, as I have thought, so shall it come to pass. And as I have, as I have purpose, so shall it stand. Verse 26. This is the purpose that is purposed upon the whole earth, and this is the hand that has stretched out upon all the nations. Do you think that anything takes God by surprise? Huh? That little problem you have? Do you think that takes God by surprise? Oh, I didn't know Jeanette was going through that. We got to do something about that. Let's let's try to come up with a plan for for Jeanette. No, it's already purposed. Do you know why? Sometimes I don't want to say sometimes, but do you know why? When we go through things, what God's trying to do? God will bring somebody really into your life that rubs you the wrong way. You know why? Not so God can change them, so God can change you. <laughs> really? Every time someone has really aggravated me, and I've had a few, 
It's always been so God can change me. But God, I don't want that person doesn't deserve it. And sometimes you can't even go to that person because that person won't receive it anyway. So you just do it in your heart. You release them, you forgive them. You know, sometimes my wife says, you need more patience. <laughs> Believe me, I'm having patience right now. <laughs> I'm, ex- I'm, a- I'm really exampling patience right now. <laughs> But none of you have that problem, right? Yeah, yeah. None of you none of you people have that problem. And I still get sometimes the long lines. I'm telling you, it still happens. But not as often. Because I'm learning. I'm letting patience have its perfect work in me. Okay? Because it's doing something in me. So these things that go on like that. Even in your life. How many times have you gone someplace and you ordered something, whether it be Popeye's or uh, Kentucky Fried Chicken or some, some restaurant you've gone to, and you put an order and you get home and it's not the same order that you ordered? What's your reaction? Come on. That's what God's looking at. He's not looking at the person that made the wrong order. He's allowed that and purposed that for your benefit because he works all things together for good. (laughs) Come on. (laughs) Huh? It's funny, though, isn't it? For what purpose? For the glory of God. All these things these adjutants that happen in our life, these aggravations, these people that get on your nerves. It's not so God can change them, so that God can change us. Because there's something in us that it's not glorifying God. There's something in us that needs to change. Boy, Pastor, I'll tell you, my husband, boy, he gets ornery. He's mean. Well, what do you do when he gets mean? I hit him in the head with a pan. Or I tell him a thing or two. Well, that's happened for God to work something out in you. And in me. Because all things work together for good to them that love God and are called according to his purpose. There's a purpose. We may not fully understand that purpose. We may not ever understand it. You know, but that's where trust comes in. That's when we understand that God is in control. I mean, when you go through one tragedy over after another tragedy, after another disappointment, you know? First, my mom dies, very close to my mom. Then my brother dies. And a short time after that, my father dies. And in between that, I had uncles and aunts that died. It's one sorrow after another sorrow. Then my mother-in-law dies. My father-in-law dies. They were only here a few years ago. That's where God's grace comes in. We don't have to worry. 
As long as we're telling them about Jesus, that's all we can do. It's their choice. I want to close with this. My brother was in hospice. His legs were about this big, swollen with edema, liver shutting down, jaundice. He was on drugs. You know, hospice comes in, they put you on that morphine and stuff like that. But God told me to put this little Walkman on his ears. How many know there's nothing wrong with a spirit? Just his body. I was listening to a man give his testimony. He was giving a testimony of exactly what my brother's life was like. And I put that on my brother, and I put that volume up. And I told him, I said, you got one more chance. Now, whether he did or not, I don't know. But he had that one more chance. Because I believe that testimony was not a coincidence. I mean, from the time he left home and everything was lining right up to what my brother, and he, I had that thing on him until he passed away. I prayed and we pray. Linda and I would pray. We'd see my brother maybe once every month or two months or three months. And we'd pray, you know, God save him. God speak to him. He come home, he come over to my house and he have a whole pocket full of tracks. He says, "Man, everywhere I go, people are giving me these things. What are these things?" So I know God was reaching him. God was answering our prayer. How many know that God can do something without you? You don't have to be it. God can do it without you. Here's what we need to do. Get out of God's way. Amen? Praise the Lord. Okay, I'll, I'll, I'll quit here. Because then we'll go on the purpose of the decrees and the basis of the decrees, why they're, they're there next, next time. Lord, help us to trust you. All-knowing God who searches the depths and intents of the heart. You know everything. There's nothing that escapes you. You are great and all-powerful, all-knowing. You know our rising up and our laying down. You know our going in and our coming out. You know everything, God. And yet, Lord, with everything that we're learning and everything that we're going through and everything that we face in life. It's for a purpose. Because we know that all things work together for good. To them that love you. And are called according to your purpose. Always remember the devil has a plot, but God has a plan. He's able, listen to me now, he's able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we could ask or think. I want to say that again. He is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we could ask, pray, and think your thoughts. Father, thank you for your presence. But Lord, thank you for who you are, that you're a good God, you're a loving God. You're a caring God. You take care of us. For we are the sheep of your pasture. You shepherd us. You correct us. You instruct us. You encourage us. 
You said be strong and of a good courage. Fear not. Be strong in the power of his might. Father, thank you for tonight. Thank you for your decrees and your word. Thank you, Lord, that we can trust every decree that you made. Everything you said is going to happen. Everything you promised is going to happen. We thank you and we praise you. Lord, help us to believe that, not from our head, but from the intents and thoughts of our hearts. Help us, Lord, from the depths of our heart, the thoughts, the intents of that heart to believe you, to love you, to serve you, and to spend time with you. And we thank you, Lord, as we sang that song tonight. Thank you, Lord. We thank you for all that you're doing, all that you have done, and all that you're going to do in our life. In Jesus' name, and all God's people said, Amen, so be it.